Hi, this is Phil Bertamati, and uh, we are here today for another session of our research on the future of events. We have uh, actually a well-known acclaimed guest tonight, uh, and Marco is going to introduce him. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to introduce uh, Bruce Mao. Um, and I will be very short in introducing him because I will simply show uh, uh, three of the many uh, tokens uh, that make his uh, reputation. And actually, I'm going to share some uh, secrets of my collection. Bruce uh, uh, designed in, uh, I think, 1995 uh, for Rem Collas and with Rem Collas, uh, this book, which is uh, the Bible of the desktop revolution. Uh, we actually uh, met uh, uh, virtually, but uh, uh, we I knew of him uh, uh, in um, at the time I was working at Flash Art International and uh, basically there were copies of the book uh, on the shelf of every graphic designer because uh, this book uh, really redefined uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, graphic design field uh, uh, in the 1990s. In 2004, uh, this is a massive change. Uh, it's out of print now. I managed to find uh, a copy on the internet, and this is the book uh, that Bruce uh, uh, published, uh, uh, bringing uh, uh, with the Institute Without Boundaries, uh, uh, design beyond any boundary uh, that was uh, earlier discussed. So it's uh, a book that brings uh, the, the vision of design uh, to uh, look into wicked problems uh, and to go beyond, uh, uh, well, retrospectively, already beyond the Anthropocene. And lastly, also this one is not easy to find. It's uh, uh, M Mao MC24, where uh, uh, Bruce distilled uh, his uh, design vision, uh, his learning and his process uh, uh, in very appealing uh, and highly communicative uh, uh, sets of uh, uh, double pages, spreads, interviews, uh, cases, and uh, what have you. So, um, Thank you so much for joining us uh, on uh, uh, this uh, final interview to uh, validate and to reflect on the future of uh, business events and of events in general. Uh, would you like uh, briefly to, to say a couple of words about uh, your work, what you're currently doing, uh, Bruce? Um, thank you, Marco. Uh, uh, it's it's delight delightful to be here. Um, I think you did I think those are good highlights. Uh, uh, you know, it's been a long it's been a long road. I've been at this for uh, over thirty years now, um, and you know what we developed in the process of life centered of uh, MC twenty four is a method of what we call life centered design. Really, a method that um, is no longer human centered in our way of thinking, and really puts all of life at the center of our thinking so that we begin to see our work in context. We start to see um, the implications of the work that we do. Um, you know, I'm working with a man named Julio Otino, who's a Dean of Engineering at Northwestern University. And he said, you're, you're not gonna solve climate change with human-centered design. Um, and that, that for me was really the kind of, you know, the, the case for life-centered design to start to think holistically and systematically about what we're doing and and really you know build a method that allows us to do that thank you well actually uh, what really uh, strikes me of uh, of uh, your latest book uh, and also the um, <clears throat> of the speech you recently uh, delivered uh, to the graduates of northwestern uh, uh, university uh, is uh, uh, your uh, unbeatable optimism and there is a passage in the book where you write uh, that at a certain point, uh, uh, one year ago, uh, more or less, uh, the, the outburst of the pandemic, you contacted your publisher and uh, you, you brought, well, this is a book that is intrinsically optimist. And maybe it's too optimist for this time. And uh, your, uh, your publisher replied, well, actually, it's a story I think you told uh, in the Northwestern speech. Your publisher replied, well, uh, short reply, the book is printed. 
longer reply, <laughs> so it's going out anyway. A longer reply, uh, the, the, the book is exactly what uh, we need now. But uh, as an author of, uh, of this book, uh, uh, and it's, it's a book by Faden, so there is a whole uh, um, process of launching the book. Uh, how do you experience uh, uh, the event side? Because normally you would go to give, deliver lectures, to, to have seminars. Uh, uh, you would go probably to do presentations in museums or uh, in galleries. Um, how, how did you redesign the event design of the launch of your book in the last year as a first question? That's a good question. The, the, um... Uh, it was really challenging. I mean, the the um, you know I've been more or less in this room for about a year and a half, <laughs> and uh, um, and you know we had to do all of the events virtually, um, and it was I mean what was exciting in all kinds of places. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we were able to do, um, you know, schools and businesses and, you know, friends, uh, organizations, uh, th that kind of thing, we, you know, which was really exciting. Uh, what we missed was the personal contact. I mean, it, the human contact um, and the social, you know, you like the actual book event is one thing, but when you go to meet people and work with them and be with them and you know, there's drinks and there's lunch and dinner and, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff that happens in a very informal, you know, beautiful way um, that is really, you know, a beautiful part of life. And, and so that, that piece was missing. And we started actually doing post Zoom Zooms so that we would have a call after the call just to, just to say thank you, actually. That's how it started. I, you know, I realized the call ends and it's like, you know, normally we would go out for dinner after the, yeah. after a lecture or, a, you know, a book signing or something like that. And, um, and here it's just, you know, it just ends, ends abruptly. Uh, and so we started booking um, post Zoom Zoom so we, we could, you know, so that I could, I could thank people and just say, you know, that I enjoyed it. Um, but, but that was a big challenge. And, we had to um, do a lot more work. I mean, the because the the kind of live event, you know, it's like the the kind of center point of a of a swirl of activity and opportunity and collaboration and 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 you know interaction uh, that all gets done because that's happening, which really doesn't happen so much in in virtual. It's like. No. Um, you, you can or you, you may or you may not. I mean, who knows who's going to be there? Yeah. Uh, and it is very, um, I have to say that um, some were better than others in terms of actually interacting. Uh, but some, it was like talking to my computer in hopes that somebody's out there. <laughs> and, and you have no feeling, you know, you have no response feeling during the process. You do. You do a little bit afterwards where people can ask questions and that kind of thing, but um, it was a it was a very challenging uh, uh, experience, and I'm really looking forward. I mean, in a weird way, it, it makes an opportunity uh, to relaunch the book physically. Like we'll be, you know, we'll be planning some events once once we're really out of the woods on this. I would like to ask Filiberto to comment a little bit on this uh, uh, informal aspect because we found it a lot in our research from the Gangxi in China to the discussion of how people do business in Latin countries. Uh, Filiberto, would you like to bring uh, your, your angle also from uh, the experience with, uh, with the digitalization of uh, business meetings? Yeah, you know, I am from the south of Italy, from Naples, and I lived in Mexico, which is basically two regions in the world where people, before doing business, we all need to smell you, literally. They need to sit, <laughs> have a meal, and see, you know, <laughs> after three hours of eating and drinking, eh, you know, how, how, how good you smell. 
Uh-huh. So <laughs> I understand uh, I, I understand that notion that you know it's very important uh, the 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 human side which is the closing which is probably not the delivery of the uh, uh, lecture which could be virtual but it's how you build and thread relationship afterwards mm-hmm. so on your uh, based on this experience that you've done what is the you think you're going to keep in the future and what is that you definitely going to go back uh, towards a more physical type of event considering that you know uh, uh, sustainability uh, it's a factor considering that uh, you are a global thinker and a global player and uh, a global launch means that you could be probably in 12 uh, global capitals in 16 weeks uh-huh. so uh-huh. what's your uh, what's your idea what do you see looking forward i i think that that um you know i saw an incredible um graph maybe uh 15 or 20 years ago that showed um uh, the the correlation between long distance telephone calls this was before the computer Uh, and air travel and what it showed is that they travel you know they they grew almost exactly at the same rate and one would think that if you have long distance telephone calls or you know these kinds of communication that it 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 replaces the need to travel but but it showed the opposite and what you realize is that what we will do as humans is use every technology to organize being together. Right? That that we'll use the technologies of communication uh, to to arrange to actually be together in person. And uh, and it's not that that it it you know inevitably leads to the other. And there are certain things that happen in some ways best you know in this format, and other things that happen that you really cannot replace uh, any others. So I I am kind of imagining a kind of bell curve you know, where you have on the you know far end to the left you have um, you know digital only digital um, you know and and quite modest scale interaction you know uh, this kind of thing uh, in the middle you have hybrid that's really uh, physical and digital and that becomes the kind of dominant business experience and um and i don't think i mean i think live events are already hybrid so um you know it, it, almost nothing is does not have a digital dimension to it um and then at the at the far right of that diagram at the lower right um is only live and that where people are turning off their phone they're cut you know they're shutting things down they're mindful, they're experiencing one another, they're experiencing um, their environment, they're experiencing the natural world, they're interacting in a real-time, focused, thoughtful, mindful, uh, very high-energy experience. And I think, I think that, for me, is the kind of bell curve of the future. And, um, and I think what you're what we'll see is mindfulness migrating into the synthesis, right, into the hybrid, and digital migrating into the hybrid. Uh, but but that the dominant mode will, will be hybrid. Do you think, uh, uh, what do you think uh, will be the case for cities? Because there are cities uh, that have lived off uh, uh, big events uh, from uh, besides over tourism, we are not looking at tourism, but the same phenomenon as over tourism has happened uh, to uh, uh, cities like Barcelona with uh, with the global communications fair, or even Milan with uh, the, uh, the the Milano Design Week. I used to live in Via Tortona, and it was a very quiet, uh, almost proletarian street. Uh, then the fashion photographers uh, in the studios came 
and then it became Via Tortona and it was not uh, livable anymore because basically during the Milano Design Week, uh, it's, uh, it's a kind of Disneyland uh, in open air. Do you think uh, the, the now Stefano Boeri is in charge of the uh, new uh, Design Week this is September that is uh, supposed to be the relaunch of, uh, of the city and of the season? What do you think will be the case with cities from your uh, point of view of uh, massive change uh, analysis? Do you think uh, this is an opportunity to make cities uh, livable again and to scale back to uh, um, not only a human size, but a, a planetary size of events uh, in thinking about emissions, uh, traveling and all the, the, the the impact yeah. that the big events have. Do you see it as an opportunity or do you think we will fall back into our uh, bad habits uh, and uh, in, in a few years we will? Uh... That's very interesting. Um, you know, I've been feeling, not, not explicitly, but I get a feeling from working with clients around the world that they don't want to go back to the old way but they're also feeling a pressure to get together. And so I think they're going to, we're going to be getting together more than, you know, obviously than we have over the last year and a half, but I don't think we're going to be getting together like we used to. I mean, you would like, you know, two years ago, three years ago, you would get on a plane for an hour long meeting, which is insane. <laughs> like, like that's an insane practice. Uh, and if we thought about it for 30 seconds, we would say, wow, yeah, that's really crazy. Uh, but we did it all the time. I mean, we would bring people in. You know, if we were doing a conference, we'd bring people in to do an hour-long presentation. And they might do a few other things, but basically they're there for the hour. Um, and they're flying from London to Las Vegas. You know, I mean, it's... And it's a terrible practice. And so I think that there is going to be some kind of more sensible way of living coming out of this, that people are, are tuned in. They also discovered they can do it. I mean, you know, two years ago, I thought everybody did this. And it turned out that almost none of us really did it very well. Now people really know how to do it. And it's become like picking up your phone. And so the idea that we can actually do this very, very simply and easily, uh, and we can you know, manage the time zones and you know, all, that, all that sort of stuff and not have to get on a plane. I mean, I'm very, very limited in what I can do if I have to do it physically. But for me to do a class somewhere, you know, to be part of a, a school program, you know, if it's an hour, it really takes an hour, not, you know, not three days. Uh, and, and so there's a, I think there's a big, um, there's a big shift coming because of that. And then secondly, I think the the fact that people discovered they can actually work remotely, and that companies are agreeing to do it. That, you know, Google has basically said you can work from wherever you want. And and then what that means is that I don't need to commute. Right? I get all that time back. You know, handed back to me, and that's a huge impact. And it means that I can I can live in uh, in different places. You know, I can I, the the world opens up in a way that that it hasn't before, uh, because the cities were really kind of sucking the world into them. Right? And uh, this I think liberates that somewhat, so that people can can participate in different ways. I think it puts pressure on the cities to be places that can compete for experience. In other words, if I'm gonna to go to the city, it better be worth it. You know, there's gotta be something there that's really worth it. And I think the thing that is worth it is, is the tribe that I'm part of. You know, I'll go a long way for that tribe. I'll go a long way for the people that have meaning for me. And so that's, that's why I think the big events are, are going to get bigger, not smaller. I think they're going to be more tribal and more kind of concentrated on their people, you know, like really understanding. You know, one of the shows that we do at, at Freeman is called SEMA, 
and it's uh it's the custom car custom car show and it is incredible <laughs> I mean, it's like like talk about a tribe of people obsessed with the culture um, these people are incredible and they live you know they live for this culture they live for this event um, and the people who run the event really understand that their job is to take care of those people, you know, and make it make it as good as they can to support that culture. And I think um, cities are going to need to to kind of think like that, to to think about the cultures they support uh, and how best to do that, uh, or risk losing those tribes. Uh, actually, I want to introduce uh, the next uh, elaboration uh, uh, and give the ball to Filiberto. You mentioned the, the traffic in Saskia, uh, Saskia Sassen uh, brought in 2006 an essay uh, at the Biennale of Architecture uh, where she analyzed the traffic of a FedEx between London and New York, and she concluded that London and New York were much more connected than London and uh, other cities that were uh, quite nearby. We have seen uh, uh, recently in the news uh, that Cabo Verde has uh, started an initiative to get uh, 4,000 uh, digital nomads uh, uh, relocating and working there. And we also spoke with a very talented, uh, well, uh, young uh, emerging talent, but actually he is an alumni of mine and uh, we, we have, uh, we will publish together, so he, uh, Nelly Blaise, uh, and actually he is already thinking about strategies for St. Martin to uh, go from the one-leg uh, economy of tourism to a two-leg economy where uh, uh, sports, uh, uh, digital nomads, high-tech can become also a component. Very bright young, uh, young talent who is uh, really Think, acting socially and thinking strategically. Now, I would like to ask uh, Filiberto the, the perspective of uh, South working uh, from uh, a technological uh, point of view, an impact point of view, and a lifestyle point of view. How uh, uh, do you think, Filiberto, that uh, uh, we could go deeper with Bruce uh, on this? Um, yeah, so. As I mentioned earlier, Bruce, I am from the south of Italy. And of course, that means that uh, most of the developed cities are in the north. And a lot of people from the south uh, relocate to Milan, Turin, uh, Venice, and work there. And most of my friends did. Uh, I did the extra step, and I went abroad, basically. And I immigrated completely just not to be part of that flow of people. but. With the pandemic, what happened is that uh, uh, our own version of the remote working, it's called South working, uh -huh. because the people from Bari, from Napoli, from Reggio Calabria, even the Romans who work in Milan, moved back to their cities and started working remotely, which of course had uh, an incredible economic impact because their consumption moved from Milan to Bari, from yeah. Milan uh -huh. to... And so That's there great. is this now <laughs> question, you know, of course, which is, you know, uh, we have seen this in San Francisco, we've seen uh, people relocating to Texas, to North Carolina, from the Silicon Valley, because they can find friendly environments yeah. and a better uh, trade-off between life, uh, you know, uh, quality of life and economic condition. But what you just said earlier made me realize that uh, the cities, and I would like you to you know, confirm and develop that a little bit, the cities need to think differently because right now cities have been competing eh, for the economic sectors. You know, what happened in the US until a couple of years ago with the second Amazon headquarter? Mm -hmm. So they've been trying to create an industry, whereas now they need to compete for people, for people of the same tribe, as you said, mm -hmm. for people from the relevant tribe. Mm -hmm. 
And by the way, the economic impact will come through that, not by getting an headquarter, but by getting the nomads. Is that, is that the reality? And is that what cities should start thinking, designing, you know, mm -hmm. designing their strategies around human beings rather than companies? Well, I think that you know, one of the principles of MC24 is compete with beauty. And the idea is that, that beauty is a competitive idea. In other words, uh, we will pay more for beauty. We'll go farther for beauty. We will suffer for beauty. People have killed for beauty. So we will, uh, uh, there, there's a million definitions of what beautiful is. Uh, but the common denominator is that it's the highest level of human experience. And if you think about beauty as a strategic idea, we need to compete with beauty. We, we need a beauty strategy. I mean, I think every business, every city needs a beauty strategy. And, you know, when I ask our clients or prospective clients, what's your beauty strategy? You know, almost no one has any answer to it. Um, Steve Jobs had an answer, um, and if you took the beauty out of Apple, uh, you probably never would have heard of it. Uh, you'd have a reasonably good technology company, uh, but when you put the beauty into Apple, you have the most valuable company in human history. And that realization that beauty is actually a strategic concept, and we have almost no learning about it. We have no real teaching. I mean, I don't know of a business school that talks about beauty as a strategic idea. Um, it's got, it, we really have to change that uh, because the opportunity is massive. I mean, you know, I think Apple has demonstrated pretty clearly. And, you know, there's a reason why the products they designed in California. Now that that may have to change now that, <laughs> that all, their, all their designers are going everywhere. Um, but but that concept of beauty as a strategic idea, I think really tells you what has to happen for cities, that we have to start thinking that way. Because um, it's not just, you know, of course we need the infrastructure, but you need a lot more than that. And, you know, there's a reason that people travel all over the world for beauty. I would like to uh, bring in your uh, systems vision, uh, and I, I, I use an anecdote. It's not a business meeting, but it is still an event. During last weekend, near Lodi in Italy, there has been a rave, an illegal rave party with no mask uh, and uh, lots of drugs and techno music. Uh -huh. And uh, I was, uh, I noticed this morning when the uh, radio news gave the uh, the National Radio News gave the, 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 the story. Uh, they mentioned that they had 50 uh, cars of the police to arrest uh, as many people as they could. And there, uh, there were 35 uh, uh, big uh, bags of garbage left behind. So in a way, events are garbage. So events uh, leave behind, the not events themselves, but events leave behind uh, themselves a trail uh, of uh, physical pollution, uh, of uh, uh, impact, and so on. Do you think uh, uh, events could be redesigned uh, for the future uh, from the point of, of view of uh, uh, bringing uh, this stream of garbage to zero? I remember one of the points of a massive change was uh, we will never uh, need materials anymore because we will uh, recycle and uh, in um, uh, Mao MC24 you write about uh, uh, the fact that we need to design thinking that uh, it's going to last forever or design time. Uh, would you see a, a strategy in event uh, design that looks at events uh, not as experiences only but as systems uh, and starts from the system uh, goal to uh, uh, minimize mm. or uh, erase the garbage. That is the only way to, to get there. The only way to really solve the problem uh, is to think systematically and really understand the implications. And 
you know, frankly, in the past, we didn't really ha need to. You know, we were we weren't that many people in the world. You know, before the, the last century, how we behaved really didn't matter. Uh, but since then, everything matters, and um, and everything counts. And so we need a way of thinking about it that we can that gets us to perpetuity. And I think the the approach we should take is that events should be edible. That imagine that everything you're using you can eat. And if that's if that was the case, then we don't have a problem. You can you can celebrate as much as you like, uh, but you're going to celebrate it in a way that that where everything goes back to the flow of the natural world and doesn't uh, disrupt or or poison that world. Uh, and that means and, and we've already seen a big shift in, you know, almost all the material that we use now is recyclable. And I think we should we need to go that extra step to say, not only should it be recyclable, it should be compostable. It should be should be something that if you leave it on the ground, it becomes the earth. And and that um, that's an that's a kind of next generation uh, way of thinking. Well, it's uh, absolutely a fantastic uh, a fantastic insight. Filiberto has uh, much more experience than I have in corporate leadership and in uh, uh, mentoring and coaching uh, startup entrepreneurs and so on. Filiberto, would you like to elaborate briefly on the human side uh, that we discovered with uh, uh, learning, mentoring, uh, coaching, uh, uh, down to mindfulness? No, I mean, I mean, the, I think this uh, fits very well with uh, Bruce's description, early description of the bell curve, you know, in that sense that uh, there is a lot that can be done in the middle, but then everyone is geared towards uh, a physical uh, world. But uh, um, I, I challenged one of the people we interviewed earlier, uh, and I, you know, and I asked them whether, you know, design thinking went to business school, and it was a big revolution for business school, okay, because they started uh, uh, a problem solving, uh, adopting a problem solving approach which goes beyond the, the numbers. <laughs> How does this look like in numbers? which is critical for experience design, for marketing, for operations, for the convergence of technologies which are merging industries which didn't used to compete with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and I challenged uh, you know, this person saying that I think that one of the next frontiers for business school is actually mindfulness. I think the business schools, as part of their leadership development, we left to adopt a mindful approach uh, because leadership it's all gonna be about empathy, it's gonna be about uh, uh, courage, uh, and it's gonna be about you know listening before speaking. Mm -hmm. Then my question to you is, if we look at the designers, at the engineers, at the uh, uh, near, um, recent graduates you spoke to about mm -hmm. the future, mm -hmm. What is that is gonna? They will have to adapt and adopt in the future to be able to do their job in twenty years from now. Uh, is I think mindfulness right. is leadership. Is it? What is that they will need to also integrate as part of their curriculum? I think you're on the the right track. That there is um, consciousness. You know, awareness. Um, you know, the, that's for me what life-centered design is about. And it's not about my life. It's not about human life. It's about life in the bigger picture. It's about a, an awareness of the life systems that we're part of, mm -hmm. and the idea that we are not separate from or above nature. You know, uh, Copernicus showed us that we. You know, the universe does not revolve around us. And Galileo proved it. 
but we've been trying to prove them wrong ever since. <laughs> we're, we're, we're certain that it actually is about us uh, and that we're the primary character in the play. You know, that, that we're the only ones on stage and that everything else is actually there to, to provide for us to have a good experience. And I think what's, what has to happen is a consciousness, a mindfulness, an awareness, empathy for the rest of life. Uh, and to really bring ourselves to, the, to a kind of understanding that, um, that we are not separate from life. We're not above it. We don't own it. Uh, it wasn't given to us to have dominion over. Uh, it, we are part of it. And, um, and if we're going to have a plausible future at anything like the scale that we currently are, we're going to have to, to gain a higher level of sophistication in our awareness and our methodology. Um, you know, <clears throat> we've been working with um, a school in Northern Canada called the McEwen School, School of Architecture. Uh, it's a new school of architecture, the first in over 40 years in Canada. Um, and it's a tri-cultural project with French, uh, English, and Indigenous leaders. And I've been going up there a couple times a year to work with them. And in that process, I realized they have a different cosmology than we do. They don't put humans at the center. They don't think of human-centered design. Um, one of the guys said to me, uh, you know, we think of ourselves as related to the rocks and the grasses, to the plants and animals. Like we're, we're related to them. So um, when you start to, to understand that world, you realize that the way that we work is mostly against nature. I mean, you look at our cities, they're against nature. That's how they started and it's still the kind of operating system. And we need to make cities that are nature. And that is gonna take a radical reinvention of the way that we think. And it's, it's I mean, that's what life center design is all about. But actually uh, you, you brought it up because I wanted to, to have it as last question because it's one of my favorite topic, uh, topics, the, the First Nations of Canada. Uh, in uh, Mao MC24, you mentioned your uh, uh, youth in, uh, in the, in the uh -huh. parks, uh, working uh, with the... the um, uh -huh. um, uh, yeah, as a canoeing instructor. As a cano yes, canoe school. Yeah. And uh, we discussed quite uh, in depth with uh, Joanne Schroeder of uh, the UN World uh, Leisure Organization. She's the... Uh, chair uh, of the graduate program of uh, Vancouver Island University. We uh, discussed how uh, uh, the, the whole truth and reconciliation process uh, offered opportunities uh, uh, to uh, rethink uh, um, indigenous culture in Canada, in Nanaimo, in uh, all over the country. Uh, from the view, point of view of uh, um, uh, recuperating uh, those traditions and uh, uh, actually uh, enabling them uh, to own uh, their own processes, their own economies and so on. Do you think uh, that the answers are in indigenous cultures? Uh, do you think uh, it is possible to go back uh, uh, there and find, you know, Ru Ruichi Sakamoto uh, at a certain point said, and finally, I, I uh, traveled uh, through all the music of, uh, of the last uh, centuries, and finally I reached Africa as the kind of uh, uh, motherland of rhythm of music. Do you think there is a substantial lesson there that we can uh, learn? I think we can learn a lot. I mean, you know, when I, uh, as I've been going uh, up to Sudbury and, and working with folks there, um, you know, it really opens my eyes to their, their cosmology, their way of thinking, their way of living, um, that they have, they have already in their way of working, the destination that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. I was kind of working towards that way of thinking over a long period of time, you know, 30 years to really, you know, understand how do I live in the world? You know, how does my work exist in the world and 
you know, what am I part of and how does this all, how, how does it all connect? And I think that consciousness of connectivity and the interrelated living world that, that there is no exterior to our world. You know, we still think in externalities. We still think that I'm going to be responsible for this and anything I can't solve, I'm just going to throw over the fence, you know, and someone is going to have to deal with it, but not me. You know, I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to worry about it. It's someone else's problem. Um, and in their view, there is no exterior. There is nowhere to go with that. And, you know, the, and there's, a, there's an idea of sacredness. And, you know, Jerry Mander wrote a book, In the Absence of the Sacred. And that book is about our corporate world. It's about the world that we've created. And, and that, you know, a lack of sacredness allows us to destroy the oceans, to destroy the rivers that, that sustain us, to destroy the air and the ecology and the climate, and you know, to really uh, destroy the atmosphere. You know, not understanding that there are things that are sacred, mm -hmm. um, that are inviolable. You know, I saw a, a documentary uh, the other day, and they said how how great it was that the government had declared, you know, 10 miles of a river as a park. And I thought, what a, what a crazy way of thinking that we would think 10 miles of a river is good enough. No, the whole river is a park. Mm. And the, the very idea of park, I think, is a terrible concept that allows us to trash everything else. You know, like the, when I was young, working as a canoeing instructor, we would go into the park. In that case, it was Algonquin Park in Northern Ontario. And it was, a, I mean, incredible, beautiful place. I mean, just... You know, spectacular. Um, and while we were in the park, we would behave intelligently. So while we were in the park, you would, you know, take out what you brought in, you would leave the campsite as you found it, et cetera. It's you know, basically common sense human behavior. The moment you got out of the park, you could behave like an idiot. Like all bets were off. You could trash everything. And we did. I mean, it, there, there was trash everywhere. Yeah. And that realization is like, wow, the park allows us to feel like we're good, good guys, but it really allows us to trash everything else. Yeah. And that, that concept of park has to be killed. You know, we have to stop thinking that we're good because we save 3%. Mm. And we have to save 97% and know that, you know, we're going to have you know, islands of stupidity in a in a sea of intelligence and not the other way around, which is what we have now. We have islands of intelligence in a sea of stupidity. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the, the time is up. I think uh, I personally, I could have this conversation for the next, uh, well, since your book is uh, Mao MC24, I would say it's 24 hours or so. There would be 23 more to go, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> your time uh, is uh, is set. Filiberto, would you like to uh, to uh, offer some closing remarks? No, I just want to take the opportunity. It's been a really great honor to have the uh, opportunity to talk to you. So I want to Likewise. thank you for that. It was a really great conversation. And uh, really, thank you very much. Uh, and... Uh, you know, if we could ever yeah. return the favor, feel free to ask anything. Yeah. Thank you. Well, actually, Thank you Bru Bruce, sure. uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you are uh, yet, uh, uh, you know how much enthusiastic I am about Canada. Your work is yet another proof point that Canada is the greatest country in North America. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we'll talk yeah. soon again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I enjoyed it.